You're listening to the Beyond the Dojo podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Jeremiah. And we are in Olympic trial season right now. So there are like lots of sports going on, mm. like lots of records being po- broken. Post trials, right? Most of the trials are over by now? I think, I think yeah, a lot of the trials are yeah. done because they, what do they start the Olympics in August or something? So yeah. Yeah, early so August. So let's talk about Shakari Richardson. Mm who is just <clears throat> unbelievably fabulous, I mean, looking from the outside in. And every time I watch her, watch the clip of her running that 100-meter um, dash and then the, all the whole thing afterwards, I, like, cry every time. But um, she got booted because right. she was tested positive for THC a few days prior. That's marijuana for you guys who were sheltered. And um, <clears throat> you know what's interesting about that is, like, I... I agree that she shouldn't be booted for having marijuana in her system. Mm. But um, I've, I had forgotten that I've actually seen some some proponents of, like, a regular marijuana use. Not, not necessarily, like, scientific people, but some people are under the impression that um, using THC or using marijuana will actually... It actually is kind of a performance enhancer and that it has such cognitive benefits Mm. that it would actually cause like it'd be good for athletes as far as recovery and relaxation and stuff well it wasn't didn't arnold Schwarzenegger say that he he smoked for recovery uh i don't know probably though i think so at least that was an urban myth but i thought that was like one of his things was like yeah for help to help him recover he would right you know partake in the mary joe right Right, and, like, I mean, there's a whole entire, like, mental health conversation now that's happening about the fact that her mother had just died and whatever. That could just be an excuse. Maybe she's a regular marijuana user. I have no idea. I don't don't see how she could be because she obviously didn't have it in her system prior to running the 4 by one whenever that was, and she's going to be able to compete in the 4 by one but not in the 100 meters. But, anyhow, definitely needs to... I'll I'll give her credit, too. The Mm -hmm. way she responded was like, yeah, we're all human. We all make right. mistakes, and she didn't point the finger or was angry. She didn't angry. deny that it was true, it, and she would. She didn't deny it. I mean, yeah. to me, that that speaks volume of a person. You know, right. a lot of times, uh, uh, professional athletes they want to point the finger to somebody else. They don't want to take yeah. the blame with, for their actions, and you know, it made me a bigger fan. Yeah, no. Plus, I, you know, the outlandish hair color and style. I still the can't nails. do the nails, right? <laughs> oh my God. I I I look at her nails, and I'm like, how does she not break those when she comes out of the blocks? You know. Just she's like hyper extending them fingers. Right, I, I don't know. <laughs> and the, you mentioned she's so much shorter than everybody else, right? So that's the other thing. Right? So this is so this is for my ladies especially, but for people in general, she's teeny tiny. So when I ran hurdles in high school, I was one of the shorter people. There was one girl who was about an inch shorter than I was, and she was one of the best in the state when she was running. Mm-hmm. It was a hundred meter hurdles, and she was she was five one. Mm-hmm. So this chick, like it, it can happen. But at that level, it's so rare because usually you have your taller, skinnier people. Like right. they're the athletic. longer strides. I mean, yeah, they have more muscle because they're sprinters. But, dude, yeah. And, and the gap that she had behind oh, yeah. her, between her and second place, is just... Uh, yeah. She's she's really going to just take this whole track and field thing by storm. So It's anyway. a shame. It's a shame that the committee stole her opportunity to shine early. Yeah, I mean... Thankfully, it, it, she's young enough to make it to the next one too though yeah the unfortunate thing is that it's a rule like so the ncaa whenever people compete in the ncaa there are very very strict rules about what you're allowed to have in your system to the point that even certain brands of creatine guys creatine you can't have in your system so creatine monohydrate is one of the most researched um supplements on the market Mm -hmm. it has a number of like strength benefits cognitive benefits all kinds of stuff and in, in the type of creatine that you use, like not, I don't think it's creatine monohydrate, but if there are certain additives in the supplement, they will straight up kick you out of an event if you test and has having that in your system. So yeah. that's, that's well known that athletes have to be very careful about what's actually in their system. Yeah. I was going to say the recently in Florida, Florida football history, there was a quarterback that says he had gotten creatine in a smoothie from a local shop and got tested for that creatine and got right. booted. Actually, NCAA, you know, sanctioned him, so. Yeah. 
It's crazy. At that time, I was like, that's ridiculous. You know, sometimes they're just using that as an excuse, right. but the NCAA does cover its butt by saying, like, These are the things. if, it's, in, if, if yeah. it's this stuff, you can't have it in your system. Absolutely. So, obviously, this is Olympic committee. This is not this quite the same, but it's just it's well known that athletes have to be careful about what's in their system. So, yeah. that is kind of on her, so at least she owned that, but the fact that it's on the list and there's not really any research showing there's not there's not there's not a lot of research on THC anyway but there's not right. a lot of research that even shows that it would have benefits for an right. athlete so why it's on the on the banned substance list I don't really understand that but whatever yeah well on a positive note with the Olympics um Tom Scott who got robbed absolutely robbed in mm. his mat last match mm. in the trials mm. I mean there were several points I, even I saw on TV. I mean, mm-hmm. and that's that's a limited perspective and everything else. Uh, some somehow I guess something happened. I don't know exactly what happened, but he's now qualified and he's going to be able to compete in Tokyo. And I think that's an amazing thing because somebody else get busted for marijuana. <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> I'll out. say I'll say this. Um, he's been one of the most. He's been a big face in in US and NKF or uh, NF yeah NKF karate national karate. Um, that. It's a shame that he had he had that opportunity stolen from him the mm-hmm. way it did the way it happened because the judging was just it was horrible yeah it was absolutely horrible so I, I didn't see any of his stuff yeah I saw his he well he I follow him on Facebook and, and a mm-hmm. couple other things and I saw a video of the last match and mm-hmm. it was like dude really yeah I mean I'm old I'm somewhat blind and I saw a couple that were like <laughs> you know what I'm saying like we're that were like yeah. wow that's obvious yeah um so that was inspiring. Yeah, it was inspiring. He's yeah. he's a community com- competitor. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, it's kind of cool. So, you know, what's funny about that is <laughs> over the past, um, probably the past month, almost every time we have our karate nights, we've been we have a Roku stick, so we turn on YouTube and we've been live streaming the um, the the Olympic trials basically for karate, yeah, for um, or anything related to that, any kind of competition stuff. We've just been streaming it in in the lobby and. Um, they had the European Championships, or, uh, yeah, EKF. Um, European Championships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was in France. That that was like... No, no, that's the, that was the Olympic Trials in France. Oh, okay. Well, that was three weeks ago. Right. Or three or four weeks ago. So we've been um, live streaming that, and everyone knows it's on. And at first, you know, I would keep the sound off, but then I just, I had played something else, so I turned the sound up a little bit. So the sound's been on in the lobby. Not very loud, but it's kind of faint. And um, obviously, everybody's like key-eyeing and whatever, and like doing their stuff, and you can hear people fighting and stuff. So last uh, Thursday, we had some guests there, and they or or somebody else they were like, "Someone is screaming," and we're like, "What?" And we're like, "Oh my god, somebody's screaming!" So we all what like we we oh, Jeremiah's teaching the class, so I'm in the lobby with the parents. So we open the door, and everybody's on the porch trying to figure out who's screaming, and we can't hear it. It was the TV screaming, key eyes because they sound like they're screaming bloody murder. So. If you uh, watch those, just make sure you remember, it's not someone screaming in your neighborhood, it's just the TV. <laughs> or your phone. Yeah, that was a, that was a, it was on me, I should have known, but I was just so caught up in what they said, like, oh my god, there's concern, someone's screaming, what's going on? Who, who put that on the TV? I put it on the oh. TV, but somebody else said there was screaming, and all the parents who've been watching it know, like, oh my god, I keep screaming on the TV. But there's a different group in there. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, okay. Do you want to talk about anything else? Mm, well, I'm watching Sumo this month. Okay. Uh, the July Basho in, in Japan. It's in Nagoya this year. Or this time. Um, last year, all the Bashos or all the tournaments were in Tokyo because of COVID. So it was kind of cool to see everybody back in the stands and everything else. Um, so something strange happened yesterday. Mm-hmm. Takakesho, which is one of the upper rank um well there's grand champions which are yokozuna champions which are ozeki ozeki and then so forth and so forth there's a ranking system and ozeki is like the second highest and this guy takakesho is a he's a he was an ozeki Mm -hmm. and there was they were doing their sumo match and everything and and somehow well the way he got thrown he got thrown out of the ring and and the the ring is is up almost three or four foot it's a a raised clay uh, platform where the ring is mm-hmm. and somehow i didn't see him land on his neck <gasps> right but he had he got he had um cervical neck issues and he had to pull out from the tournament 
Like, I completely, oh, when I saw it happen, I thought, oh, God, he blew his knee out again. Yeah. Because he had blown his knee up, like, two or three tournaments ago. So, yeah. like, a year ago or something. So, we, I figured, oh, man, he re-injured it. Yeah. But it comes out that he's actually had, like, cervical in- cervical spine injuries. And I'm like, oh, Lord. I mean, obviously, they said it's a month out. Yeah. So, basically, that's just uh, maybe a herniation. Not a herniation, but a, a bulging disc or something tweaked or something like that where it pinched a nerve or whatever. But, dude, literally, when he got up, he just went... And he laid on the, he, he put his elbow on the, 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 uh, the, the platform there and he kind of just held it, he kind of stood there and he was, you know, it looked like he was trying to stand on his knee and he couldn't. Mm-hmm. Got up mm-hmm. after a minute, stood up and, and, and was able to walk away. Mm-hmm. So we thought, I just thought, you know, it was just whatever. But dude, guy, guy pulled out, man, and had some neck injury. So that was crazy. That's got to be really scary when they're that size and yeah. thrown around and dude, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was the one of the other new rules are implemented. Is, um, uh, there's certain strikes that will will knock a player, uh, knock a sumo player out, mm-hmm. and they they're really they're starting to um, they're not really outlawing it, but they're making it like where it you could you could be penalized for it. And Enho, which is one of the the smallest sumo wrestler at the salary level. Mm-hmm. Dude, this guy took took an open hand palm strike to the jaw, neck jaw line, like three or four different times, same side, and in, in the match, and got got knocked silly, but didn't get knocked out. Right? right. Went to stand up after he got thrown out of the ring. Went to stand up and was wobbly. They gave him a minute to kind of pull together because they couldn't call the match because it was it's what's called a um, monoe, which is it's not de- it's not a clear defi- uh, defined win. Right. So not both soon, not one wrestler was out of the ring before the other. It was like almost simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So usually when they say Monoui, you get to you try again. You basically wrestle again. Uh, one of the helpers came up to check on him, and he said, oh, "I feel a little woozy," and you could tell he wasn't Russian. like like just out of passing, you know. And then right. so they called the Monoui. Then they said, "No, he, he's incapable to continue," and he got pissed. He was like, no, I didn't mean it like that. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. And it's the funniest thing. They, so they go to have him bow out, right? He stands back on the basho, goes a step into the ring, and damn near trips over the <laughs> oh, the border and, like, stumbles oh. into the ring. And it was like, he could, the look on his face is like, shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just, I was like, huh, yeah, good rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But concussions it, are not to be trifled with. Yeah, I feel bad for those guys. You guys got, these guys are like 200 pounds and stuff, and they're going against 400 pounders that are not just fat and flazy. They are strong, heavily built men, and oh my gosh. Yeah. Some of the small guys, you see them get smacked in the head, and it's like, dude, how many of those can you handle before you're just like, I don't want to do it anymore? Yeah. You know, and that was one of those conversations with, with Enho, that particular sumo wrestler, mm-hmm. how he's like, you know, I feel good in the first half of the tournament, but by the, the last half of the tournament, it's a real mental struggle to get into the ring to face that. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, you're in a car accident every time you hit these guys. <sighs> Jesus, man. It's, I could not do that. you know, I enjoy watching sumo because the athletes are really good athletes. I mean, right. they're super flexible, super coordinated, balance, speed, everything's there, power's there, but they don't look like athletes. You know, they don't look like your stereotypical bodybuilding athletes, you know, and, mm-hmm. but some of these guys, you could look, you look at them and go, yeah, they got, they got a layer of fat, but underneath that, they're just brick houses. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, but you know, it kind of, you know, I relate. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had their flexibility, man. They they are super flexible, but mm-hmm. other than that, that's sumo. That's my thing in the morning. I, I I wake up and watch sumo matches from the night before, and I hear it while I'm sleeping. Sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> so what we wanted to do was like a kind of a series on like supplemental training methods with um, regular karate training. So today we were gonna go over band training so um what that looks like all that kind of stuff i actually have a few studies here that have actually researched training with elastic bands tubing so i don't think they actually use tubing in these Mm. which is i think what most people would end up using is actually elastic tubes um but they use bands so the kind of the premise is the same traditionally we use bicycle inner tubes yeah, the, the little two Yeah, the two yeah, inner yeah, tubes yeah. out of a bicycle. Wheel. Yeah, I actually have these longer bands that are like, they're like 42 inches mm-hmm. um, folded. I don't know. They're big circle. And you can, you can like loop them around things. You can double them. You can hold them. You can 
wear them on your waist. Mm. You can do all kinds of stuff with them. I love them because I feel like they're really great. Those are that's from Power Systems, I think. Um, but I like those. But the tubing is good as well. Mm. Um, so I think I want to go over these real quick, and then we'll kind of discuss it because the three of them are pretty similar and they're pretty straightforward as far as what they actually yeah, did. Yeah, I agree. So the first one is effects of training against elastic resistance on jab punch performance in elite junior athletes, and this is by Markovich et al. Uh, it's from 2016. So basically, like the beginning of it, it says that the goal was to investigate the effect of elastic resistance training on the performance of a jab punch, to explore the associated changes in kinematic and kinetic patterns, and to assess possible differences among competitors of different specializations. So they actually had three different types of competitors. Let's see what yeah, they were. Yeah, boxing, they savat, and... Oh, savat, yeah, and then... Uh, kickboxing. Was, kickboxing, okay. So those are the three types. These are not on karate people. These are on, like, boxer-type type, type folks. But martial uh, artists, and love Right, and so, so their punching is going to be a little bit different than ours, but they were kind of looking at how their kinematics changed. So how did the actual path of the movement right. change um, as they added that, that elastic band on there? Um, oh, yeah, it's right here. So it's kickboxing, savat. What is savat? Savat's that fr French boxing where they kick, too. Oh, okay. I believe. Like a kickboxing. Like yeah, it's just a kickboxing. yeah, it's French French boxing, basically, where they kick in. It's boxing, but it's French. Wee oui, wee. Oui. No, no, dude, <laughs> dude, some of their techniques are pretty cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it, it's legit. Um, so pre-test and post-test consist consisted of a single session aimed to test the maximal velocity and displacement of tracked joints, as well as to assess the elbow extensor and flexor muscle strength. So they were trying to see how fast and how far um, each position that was being tracked moved. They actually had little little pinpoints on the person. I don't know what those things are called. Little trackers on different joints, on the hips, on the arms. Um, they wanted to see how far they moved and how fast they moved. And then they also wanted to test the actual strength of the elbow flexor, which would be the biceps, and the extensor, extensor which would be primarily the triceps. Um, so let's see here. Um, so they were thinking that... Um, that the elbow muscles, which are biceps and triceps, that they were the most important to be tracked because they were going to be the ones most effective by hold, most affected by holding a band. So if you know anything about biomechanics, essentially when you punch, you're not just using your arm, um, you're not just using your triceps, you're using your your anterior delts. So right in here, you're using your serratus, which is a small muscle, kind of on the ribs. You're using your pect pectorals, which are on your chest. So there's a lot of stuff happening whenever you're punching, and then also to a degree, you're using the biceps because it acts as like an elbow or as a shoulder flexor, just a little bit. So there's a bunch of muscles that are actually being used. But they felt like tracking the muscles on the arm would be the most beneficial in, in this case. Yeah, but um, the primary movers for uh, elbow extension or flexion is biceps and triceps, right? For elbow extension, right. Yeah. yeah, and that's what they were talking about there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the main one they wanted to look at, rather than looking at what's happening at the shoulder. Yeah, I think I think that being said, if you think about boxers and how they punch, their jab mm -hmm. is just the... It is a lot of elbow It's stuff. just a lot elbow extension, not, you know, they're, we're not talking about reverse punch, and, right. and their starting position isn't at their hip, it's yeah. in front of them, so basically it's that extension. Right, so it's a lot more of that, right. that makes sense. Yeah. So, and these, these are all basically boxing style kind of punches. So. Right. So this program that they went through after they did their initial testing, they did um, six weeks, they did three times a week. And they did six sets of 10 repetitions of jab punch. So basically they had a bid mitts in front of them and they were holding a resistance band and they were they had to actually punch at the mitt. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was their training. Um, and they tried to do the same elastic resistance for everybody, I guess each session, but they did try to gradually increase that resistance. So they were actually increasing the resistance because if you know anything about um, like any kind of weight training or resistance training, progressive overload is one of the concepts. So if you want to get better at something or you want to, you want to get stronger, you want to get faster, you have to some, somehow increase the, um, uh, what would the term be? Just increase the, like, the resistance or the, the, the difficulty of what the exercise is. So in this case, increasing the resistance in order to increase strength. Um, and they're trying to see also how that how that plays into increasing the speed as well, or incre increasing the, the time of the movement, or decreasing time of the movement. Um, let's see. Um, one of the things they did notice is that training with the elastic bands actually didn't um, didn't cause the movement to be much different. Mm -hmm. So them using the band, they didn't like struggle against the band. They didn't do anything crazy, which would be something that I would be concerned about is that the, that the movement pattern would break down. Yeah. In the case of these guys, it didn't. They were, they now obviously the people who were running the test, they were watching them because they didn't really 
necessarily want their movement patterns to break down necessarily, but they were going to observe that as they gradually increase the resistance. So in this Plus case, they were they using elite that. athletes, elite am amateur athletes. So it wasn't like they, it was the first time they punched. It was like they, they've had the pattern, motor pattern down. And so, right. Yeah. So these, these were guys who had been doing yeah. at least some boxing. So but they kind of knew how to punch. Wouldn't you say that, um, the breakdown of form is generally because of too much overload? Yeah, it's usually too much too soon. Too much too soon, right? And yeah. that's how they start to incorporate different muscle groups and stuff like that. That's the thing about choosing your band as well. Yeah. Is like whenever you get your tubing or you choose your band to use, it's you have to have the right tool for the right task. So right. if you're going to be doing punching, um, so this is mm, so, so whenever you are as a teacher, if you are going to be teaching a class and having them work on, let's say, like reverse punching with a band. One of the mistakes that I have made and that I've seen others make as well is you give them too hard of a resistance band. So you got to right. think that if we're doing like reverse punch, the muscles at the hip and in the leg that are causing the hip rotation are stronger than the muscles of the arm and of the shoulder that allow you to move the band the rest of the way. So it's, it's fine if you want to use a hard resistance band to practice the hip rotation, but if you want to still time it properly and get a, a good technique while punching with the band, the band has to be lighter. There's no Absolutely. way around it. Otherwise, you end up with this really muscly yeah. shoulder punch. Right. You, you engage larger uh, different groups to assist. And, yeah, in and order your, to your make up the goes, difference. Yeah, your technique goes to prep. Right. Um, so after they uh, retested everybody, they said that a small amount of, res of resistance could result in a significant increase in hand peak velocity in athletes of different specializations. So just a small amount of resistance could actually significantly increase velocity. Now, like right. Jeremiah said, these were not elite athletes. These were kind of like recreational type athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These and this order is elite. Huh? Elite junior athletes. Oh, elite junior athletes. This, okay. The other so one those is, are kids. These are, right. Yeah, the other not one kids, was, but, uh, were right, right, right. Okay. So, the, so in this one, um, they are basically saying that you don't really need a ton of resistance in order right. to see great increases in velocity. I think that's the, the rule of thumb for any kind of resistance training within, like, band training or something like that. Or even weight training when, mm -hmm. when you're doing martial art moves mm -hmm. is that you don't want to overload yourself. You want... You want the resistance to be there just enough to where you're challenged, but not to where you're really pushing yourself to get it done. Right. So it's a complete different mindset in, when you do this kind of training compared to, let's say, free weights. Right. And, or you have a, a power workout where you're trying to build the strength in the muscle. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you know, I, I, I think um, when we spoke to Steve last night, he was that was like one of his main points was it's a different kind of training mm -hmm. and that you have to really start low right really low and, mm -hmm. and get that feel and to get the benefits right and the ma major problem is that most people jump too high too quick right so i kind of want to go over the principles of that in just a second because there's okay. actually some overlap with with strength and conditioning as well so a couple of quick things just to kind of end this one out um they were saying that um there was a lot of whenever you started adding in resistance, there was a lot more displacement in certain joints. So basically they, the joints moved further mm. um, and the hip was one of the ones they noticed. Right. It was most notable, it had the most movement. So once you started adding in that resistance band, these boxers started using their hips a little bit more. Now whether or not, you know. That, primarily the hip. But the but placement that was, the was main, primarily the main one. In the, in the hip right. action, yeah. Right, um, and they feel like that may actually, so, so the movement time, um, remained pretty much the same but because there was more distance that was covered mm. kind of increased the velocity as right. a byproduct so um they felt like um like that could be one of the main advantages of using resistance bands is that you're actually getting a lot you're maybe getting some more extra movement out of certain joints or maybe using the hips a little bit more yeah. on that one um which obviously karate people know well know very well how to use their hips or to use their hips right. um so this study and the next study both reference the last study that um, yeah. we're going to go over. So I'm going to yeah. kind of skip part of this. But basically, um, one of the things that was being st that was stated here is that is um, I'll come back to this in a second. But um, you're primarily using the agonists whenever you're using resistance bands. So your agonist is the main muscles that are supposed to be doing a movement. You have an antagonist and an agonist on every movement. 
if you're extending the elbow, the agonist is the triceps, the antagonist is the biceps. The biceps actually will try to stop you from extending your elbow because it's supposed to do flexion. And the agonist is the one that extends the elbow. They were saying that using bands is actually really good for working the agonist, but we'll come back to that in just a minute. All right, so agonists are the muscles that contract in the movement and antagonists are the muscles that stretch. That the should, move. they should be stretched. They, they should, should be, be stretching relaxed. in the movement, okay. Right, so the thing about, um, and, and this next this, this next study kind of talks about um, kind of talks about um, strength and conditioning. Mm. Let me just make sure there wasn't anything else from this one. Mm -mm. Mm. Not really. Okay. Yeah, they were said there was no differences in the in the three different types of athletes either. So the different types of boxers, yeah. they all received benefits. It didn't yeah. matter which right. style they were coming from. Don't mind the snoring dog. Oh yeah, if you can hear the snoring dog, she's she's bored. So the next one was um, strength and conditioning considerations for mixed martial arts. Um, it was by Bounty et al. I see Bill Campbell's name in here. He's from USF. Anyhow, there was this was like a kind of a meta meta analysis. So they looked through a bunch of different studies. I just want to read something. This is not exactly related, but this is just a great point. They said just because a winning mixed martial artist trains a certain way, i.e. uses certain strength and conditioning techniques or methods, it does not necessarily mean that it is the optimal or most effective training methodology. So just because someone trains in a specific way for strength and conditioning or in their re regular training or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the most optimal for you or for everybody else. Right. So that is something to always keep in mind is whenever you see other people adding in supplementary training, you got to be wary about why they're doing that and like what their background is or like what basically their goals why are. Their, what their goals are, why they're yeah. basically incorporating that. Well, that's that should be obvious because, you know, and it's not. Most people think that you could just take a template workout and apply it to yourself and get the same results. And that doesn't always work that way. And that way. doesn't work that way because everybody's different. Everybody's in, you know, there's all these anatomy and kinesiological kinesiology that it's word. not it's not just the differences it's also like is the program worth a shit because sometimes people will create strength programs for themselves or they think that they're doing one thing and that's not what they're doing i mean there are even people who first get into like bodybuilding type stuff and they do a certain exercise like there, there are people okay as an example a sumo squat so that's feet out toes turned out you squat down and come back up there are women who do sumo squats because they think that they're engaging their inner thighs more, their adductors. Not okay, true. That's true. not true. No, it's actually your quads. So okay. there's research that shows that when you have your legs out like that and you're doing your squats, you're actually using the outer portion of the quads okay. more, not the inner portion of the thighs more, but they think that because maybe they feel a certain thing. So yeah. things are not always what they appear to be. That's the reason you have to look at all, all conditioning programs, not just like strength training, but any supplementary program, just look at it with a critical eye. So um, when it comes to like the, we talked about the adding resistance to a band. Mm. Um, so there are, di there's like a continuum of different types of movement. There is like your very slow endurance based type movement, like me talking with my hands all the time. There's a little bit quicker movements, um, like or, or there's like more strength related movements where you're using your type two muscle fibers, but you're really engaging like some of these heavy lifters in your body in order to make make something move that's really really heavy. But then also along that continuum is your more ballistic movements, which also use type two fibers, but they it's a, it's a quicker contraction. So um, how you how you load yourself is going to is going to basically determine where you fall along that continuum. If I want to get really strong and I want to move a little bit slower, if I'm doing a bench press, I would use more weight. I would end up by default having to do fewer repetitions because it's freaking heavy and I'm going to run out of steam at some point, usually within, you know, five to 10 or 12 repetitions. I'm not going to be able to do much more. If I take that same bench press movement, and I lighten up the load. So let's say rather it's, let's say I was working with, I don't know, 100 pounds and I drop that down to like, I don't know, 60 pounds or something. At 60 pounds, at 60% of what I was just working with, I'm actually able to do more repetitions and or I could move faster. So if I chose to move more quickly, so if I've got the bar down at my chest and I explode the bar up, then I'm able to ink work on my velocity, but I'm not gonna be able to do that necessarily for a ton of repetitions because I am still gonna get taxed 
Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're using less weight, but you're moving it more quickly. Now, if you take the same idea and you add a band instead, so it's the same type of movement, but we're not going to do a bench press. We're going to do a, like a band press or like a push or a, like a punch, like we're doing, like they're showing in these studies. It's the same concept. If the band is too heavy, you're just slowing yourself down and you're basically doing a strength exercise. By contrast, if you lighten up that band and then you're able to practice going quickly, you're not going to be able to do tons and tons of repetitions, but you'll be able to do more and you'll be able to move more quickly. That's just how that concept works, mm. basically. Um, did you have anything to add to that? That was like 10, 10 million words. That was a lot of words. That's a lot of words. For, I'm so wordy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, so basically, when you do words. band work for karate, you want to go fast. And you don't want to go light in light weights, not heavy and slow. The, re the reason I make that point... Wow, that's like eight words compared to your thousands. The reason <laughs> I explain it that way is because I want people to realize that if, if you're not doing band training, if you're not doing this type of training, but mm. you are doing strength All training, right, right, you can that. lighten up your strength training movements and still use them for ballistic type movements. So this second study that we, that we looked at... Um, they actually have an entire section talking about sp speed development for MMA. And once again, they, they referenced the last study with the band training, but they also talk about like plyometric type movements where mm. you're like, throwing a, a medicine ball, or you can just move the barbell really fast or the dumbbell really fast. I wouldn't do this on every type of movement, but there are certain movements where you're using lots of joints where you can move it really, really fast and you're getting the same, like similar types of benefits. Um, but you're not necessarily doing your sport specific type movements. That kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're just like moving the barbell really fast. Mm -hmm. So don't think that, you know, I don't want to necessarily get strong. So I don't want to lift weights. Well, then you just lift weights differently. You lift weights faster with less weight. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So let's talk about this last study. Mm -hmm. So the last one was one that I actually had a little bit of trouble with. And, um, Steve actually had to help me understand some of this so um well not oh wait let's see okay so this last one was a comparison of ballistic movement and ballistic intent training on muscle strength and act activation it was by nicole din and david bim so this study was referenced a couple of times but i'm going to kind of look at this other this other um summary of it because it was a little bit easier to understand so basically what they did is they had, they didn't have that many people in this study. I think they had... 20. Yeah, like 20. 10 of them, 10 of them were... Controls. Right? Well, ten, like 10 of them were not trained. So 10 of them were untrained people. They like didn't know how to punch. The other 10 were ones who had had some training. Hmm. Um, and I can't remember the exact um, sports they actually got them from. Do you remember? No. Which sports they were from? Um, oh, martial arts... Yeah, okay, so free of injury, recreationally active, so 20 participants, free from injury, recreationally active, participating in other in either either resistance training or martial arts three to six days per week, but not competitive. So not all of them were martial artists. They were right. just doing some kind of resistance training. Right. Um, so basically, they took the two groups, and they, or they, they took the 20 um, people, they broke them into a couple of groups, and they had one group, um, let's see, I don't think they did much of anything. Um, but one group actually had to work on doing the band type training. So they did like five to 10, let's see, what was it? Five to 10 reps, three work weeks, three through eight. So they did, what was it? I forgot where it went, but basically they were just doing repetitions of using the band and they were progressively overloading as well. And then the other group was actually using a strap. So this is this idea of, what's it called? Um, ballistic nice intent. Yeah. So rather than actually like throwing a punch, they were actually pushing against a strap that wouldn't allow them to move. Um, and I guess they were trying to determine whether or not like having that neuromuscular firing of like, I want to go fast, even though this isn't letting me go fast. So is this gonna actually uh, cause increases in speed whenever I get retested? Uh, the answer was no. It actually did not have any increases. Some um, cases it decreased, yeah. Yeah, I think actually that some of that that's called the, that was the isometric group. I think some of them actually yeah. decreased. I don't know if you can if you're watching the video. There's actually a picture of them laying on the um, laying on a Bench, thing here, the and they've got some, some electrodes hooked up because they were studying some EMG activity as well. Um, this is just kind of a funny side note. One of the tests that they did 
is they, if I understood this correctly, they, it was called a quick hands test. So they had to stand with their hands against a mat that was against a wall, mm -hmm. and they would start a timer, and they would slap the mat as fast as they could. <laughs> and that was, they were counting how many slaps they got on the mat. So um, that was one of their quick tests. And then they also had a reaction time test mm -hmm. where they actually had to push a button, and I think it was further away. Mm -hmm. So they started with their hand on the button, and they had to push a button further away, so, or they had to reach out. Anyway, it was, it was interesting. Um, but uh, the the group that was doing the the ballistic stuff, I actually found it. The band stuff, they did three days a week, three to four sets of ten reps. Okay, so I want you to notice here that they were only doing like ten repetitions, and then they would take a break. So they would do ten reps on one side, ten rep, or they actually they only trained one arm in the study. But if you were doing it in a class, you do ten reps on one side, ten on the other, and then take a break. Part of that is because um, movement form starts to break down after actually about seven repetitions. Whenever you're doing power type movements, ballistic, like quick type movements, um, if you're trying to maximize power output, so you're maximizing the amount of force that you're gonna be transferring, maximizing the speed, um, and also keeping good form, you can only do that for about seven repetitions on average before things start to break down depending on the resistance. Um, and even sometimes with lighter resistances, the same thing happens. So if you keep it to a lower number of repetitions, you're, you're less likely to have that kind of thing happen. That's kind of the same same point that we're making here again. Um, let's see, that was the isometric group. Um, so, so some interesting stuff that we had to have some help interpreting was um, the activation of certain muscles. So they actually tested the triceps on the back of the arm, the biceps on the front of the arm, the pecs, which are on the chest, and the lats, which are on the back. And they were trying to see what kind of activation happened um, at different with different types of training. Um, and they had noticed that in, let's see here, there wasn't any changes in force production. So the activation, what they, one of the things that was made, one of the points that was made, I'm not sure if it was this study or a previous one, was that just because a muscle is activating doesn't necessarily mean it's producing force. So that kind of goes back to like why it's important to know which, like, to, um, to be able to intentionally use certain muscles to produce force in a movement. Just because you're activating a muscle doesn't necessarily mean that it's aiding in force production. So you can be really, really tight and be super tense in your arm, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna produce more force. You're not gonna transfer more force into a target. Um, yeah, here it is. It says an increase in triceps EMG activity. So an increase in activity in the triceps without an increase in force output might seem perplexing. This is another reason they said. Increases in electromyographic activity, however, are not solely attributable to increased recruitment of motor units. So um, basically, they were saying that um, you're, you're trying to synchronize certain activity, and just because a muscle is being activated doesn't mean it's being synchronized with other muscles. So if it's not synchronized properly, you're not going to see an increase in, in, in force output. The other thing is that because of the type of training, it wasn't strength or hypertrophy work. So there's a chance that also just doing the ballistic stuff, it increased it, it, it aided in increasing speed, but not in increasing the amount of strength that you were building or the amount of um, muscle size that you actually had. And those are the types of things that would, that would add to increase force output for the most part, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so this is the last one that was a little bit confusing. And this is kind of what we talked about earlier about agonist antagonist. Mm -hmm. So, um, Whenever you're doing band training, the interesting thing is that, that what's being theorized is that when you use a band, it's functioning as the antagonist. So basically a band is trying to stop you from being able to extend your arm all the way, or if you were kicking, it's kind of trying to stop you from kicking all the way out. Um, so opposed to that, if you weren't using a band and you were just using your body weight, whenever you're punching, something has to stop the movement. Either you're going to snap your skeleton or the opposing muscle to the movement is going to have to serve as a breaking mechanism. And for the most part, they're saying when you use resistance bands, it does that for you. So you're able to completely focus on using the agonist, which is the main muscle that's, that's causing the movement. Um, but if you want to see a better, um, a longer duration punch and it's in the sense that like you're maximizing the amount of punch that you get, you're maximizing the amount of speed that you can, that you can produce, then you would have to properly time when that antagonist is contracting. And this was 
worded really weird in this study. But basically, this is just kind of reemphasizing, even though these guys are not from a karate background or not necessarily from a martial arts background as far as I know, um, they're saying that, look, like, look, if you, if you want to use that breaking mechanism, you need to time it properly. So whenever you're punching, the contraction force, we always talk about kime and stuff, it should happen at the end of the technique. You have to be super careful and not start tightening up earlier on in the movement for the sake of forcing through, forcing yourself through or whatever, because otherwise you're going to start taking away from the technique. So that was kind of didn't the main it, stuff. Didn't it, didn't it make it make the point that the bands actually help you time it better? I, I think that was kind of what they were getting at. Are yeah. implying that? Because that's what I thought. It was like the timing of the antagonist uh, is better and allows for a longer range of whatever yeah and well you know why it could be is because the band is functioning as the antagonist then you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to contract so you're basically learning to to relax that muscle right more so yeah i think that's what they were getting you tighten up at the very extension you're you're able to tighten it better right so at the end of the technique you're able to have that little bit of contraction Um, i feel like that's probably one of the main benefits in your tech for your technique with using band is not the strength or speed it's the timing of the technique that's better yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, I mean, that's, so. I mean, there's obvious increases. I'm not denying that. Yeah. But what I'm saying, like, to me, technically, I would say, you know, the timing of that, that kime point, that contra- antagonist movement or right. antagonist engagement is, is where it's at. Well, I think you could also make an argument that proper timing mm-hmm. and obviously mechanics as well attribute to increased speed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but, like, putting things in the right position. Right. But I guess what I'm saying is uh, when you band train, I would encourage you not to think about the speed of everything, but think more about the, the timing of everything, you know, instead yeah. of going, oh, I want to go fast and then starting to tighten up and go right. try to go fast and use different muscle groups. Don't think of it that way. Just think I'm going through the motion and then I'm going to stop at this point. I'm going to stop at this point so mm-hmm. that you, like you said, allow the proper muscles to contract and you do their thing. Right. The moment you contract the wrong muscles or your antagonist, you're stopping and you're halting your technique, right? Yeah. So. So I wonder if maybe like kind of similar to how they did in a couple of these studies, if it would be good to even like emulate what they did. So they actually had like, they had a strike mitt. And then one person had the band and it was secured behind them. And this is just for punching. Obviously, we just talked about punching this whole time. But Mm -hmm. basically, their job was to try to hit the mid as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you're trying to produce a lot of force into the mid, then that might lead to some issues because you have that band there. And we're trying to reduce the use of of excessive muscle tension. Um, But maybe doing that and trying to remain as as relaxed as possible. So that's going to be the tough thing is like when you add resistance. Mm -hmm. So... Maybe, maybe this is a great idea for a progression. If you can go through your training, so let's say you're just working on reverse punching or front kicking, mm-hmm. and you can practice doing that in as relaxed of a position as possible with proper movement, mm-hmm. so proper mechanics and proper technique. And then from there, you add that resistance just a teeny tiny bit and try to keep that relaxed type feel, mm-hmm. but now there's a little bit of extra muscle tension in the proper muscles because you've added that tension, but it's not something that you're having to like consciously work through or consciously cause. Mm. Maybe that would be a good idea for progression starting from no band to adding in a band. What do you think? Yeah. um, I think going back and forth with it. Okay. You know, starting with no band, going with a band and then going back with no band and seeing where you're at. And then, you know, to improve anything you do, and athletic movement whatever is you got to be really self-aware of what's going on Mm -hmm. you know you got to think about what is going on Mm -hmm. not to the point where it hinders your movement right but to the point where you you feel oh i lifted my shoulder oh i'm tight up here i feel my muscles tighten or loot or or they felt worked out you know right um i think a band personally um is great for that Mm -hmm. you know it's i always used bands training myself Mm -hmm. and i and was for literally calling me out my poor technique. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I would do it and then be like, man, why is my tri- my traps feel so tired? I think you have to be really self aware to be you, able to I, I agree with you, yeah. but that's the whole point in karate and sometimes to be self aware. To be, be self aware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And that's a good training aspect of it. So, you know, I really enjoyed the the, the papers and enjoyed the information that it offered and, and mm. some of the insight, but at the same time, it reinforced some of the things I believed. Right. You know, like, 
doing it properly. Yeah. Engage, learning how to engage the antagonist when it's proper, not when you you know you want to because you want to get to. Yeah. yeah. Your want to always gets in the way of what you need to do. Right. You know, I want to punch hard, so all of a sudden you tighten up. And that's not the whole idea at all. The wanting to punch hard makes you actually go behind or backwards instead of just saying, I'm a punch. You know? Something I think would be interesting is, um, you know, the limitation of using something like a band is that you have certain movements that are more complex. Mm. So kicks, front kicks become pretty uh, more complex. Roundhouse kicks are way more complex. Right. So I'm, I'm curious if you... If you secure the band in different places and maybe pull in different directions, depending on the type of movement, I wonder what difference it makes. So, like for a front kick, you can Stagnant. attach it. Well, like for the front for a front kick, you can attach it to your ankle, and you can still have that very forward linear movement and practice with the band with the thing right. at the ankle. Um, if the band is down, it's a different resistance than if the band is straight back behind right, you. Like right. if it's at ankle, if it's if it's secured at ankle level, mm -hmm. um, if the base is at ankle level, or if the base is at like hip level. That would be different, even though it would be difficult to kind of get that that yeah. that curved movement. But then if you do roundhouse kick, it's even weirder because now you have to lift the leg and then do a kick. I wonder like how you can change the base angle or like the attachment position of the band in order to to help that one. I don't know about the moving segment of the technique. So let's say you're doing front kick and mm -hmm. front stance, left mm -hmm. leg forward. Yeah. Um, I would encourage to change the angle of resistance in the supporting leg. So one of the first time you do it, it's around the ankle of the front leg, mm -hmm. behind you. You know what I'm saying? Like pulling directly behind the front leg, and you do the front kicks. And then the next so time, it's, it's on your stance leg. Yeah, it's on your supporting than on leg. Your kick. Yeah, instead of the kicking leg, it's on your supporting leg, your okay. static leg. Okay. Right. And then next time you put it around your knee, and let's say you pull it laterally or to the side. Okay. Not a lot to where you fall off balance, but I think that to me the different angles would work better because the stationary leg. So it's testing the stance instead yeah, of the Yeah, the static technique. movement. The static gotcha. part of the technique, not gotcha. the moving part. Because I feel like the band can only be put in certain ways for certain techniques to work. Mm -hmm. And at different angles, it gets in the way. Yeah, I can definitely it, li it limits the movement. It limits. It just gets in the way. So like a front stance, I think around the ankle at a low point is good. Mm -hmm. um, side snap kick, same thing. Around the ankle, low point. To do the actual kick. Do the actual kick, gotcha. right? But roundhouse, to me, is still... It's like higher... But it's not hip like hip height. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine like yeah. where you would even put it so that you don't hit yourself in the crotch. A lot of people don't do banded work with roundhouses. I would I don't blame them. I'm just right. trying to see if there's any right. any but, way of making it work. But like what to me is can benefit from band work more is the stability of everything. Yeah. It's this the, the leg that's it holds you up, the stationary leg, the, the root leg. Being able, because you know, some people, you know, they, they go to front kick mm -hmm. and they're, they're supporting the knee will float out. They'll actually yeah. turn their foot out a little bit right. with no control. Right. And being able to control that is, you know, be more beneficial. So that comes down to more of like a, a using higher resistance for actual strength or maybe not and even for muscle engagement. For strength, yeah. Right. For isometric strength rather than ballistic. Right, 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 right. Just so that that can help. Now, yeah. that's how I would use bands to help stationary stuff static stuff you know in your stance mm -hmm. you know have the if you're in front stance have it behind you yeah right but obviously not to the ground but to at the hip height because that's where your pelvis your pelvic floors or your pelvis area and you want to control that the most mm -hmm. so there's lots of definitely a lot of possibilities oh, for absolutely. using bands that are outside of just using it for ballistic purposes right? absolutely i've actually had we've had students do that before where they are in a stance and they're doing whatever like they're maybe doing reverse punch but the band is actually pulling on their stance mm -hmm. so if they start to pull away from the band and it's increased resistance and you're like ah crap so you have to like stay in position that's actually yeah. really nice no um, stance work. i think i think to me the band just like i said it kind of exaggerates the weak points of your technique okay yeah um and that also applies to stance mm -hmm. structure supporting legs i mm -hmm. mean it's all there yeah. you don't just have to test the moving part mm -hmm. so yeah one I, thing i have liked sorry go ahead i i always enjoy i used to do it at the dojo where i'd put the band around my knee and then i would take and put the band around the makiwara at the same height not yeah. facing the makiwara mm -hmm. but being parallel to it so that the band parallel. Is, yeah so the band was pulling back towards Pulling my knee out, yeah, 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 and I'd have to engage the inductor to keep it in there and keep that squeeze, that squeeze in feeling. Yeah, okay. So it just gave me better support. See, I I do it the opposite way, where I'll face 
I'll, I'll, if I if Amakiwara is to my right, I have mm. my left knee forward right, so and it's, it's pulling, pulling it in. in. And my job is to in, is to use the abductors to kind of hold that knee in place right. so it doesn't fall to the side. And kind of a lot. Go ahead. I was gonna say that's because our weaknesses in our stance are different. Yeah. Right. Like I tend to allow my Your knee knees to kind of goes kind of, out. No, my knee kind of comes in a little bit. Like when I go to kick, I'll actually. I'm sorry, my knee will fall out. Right. So and, the, and I have to squeeze it in to kind of keep my mm-hmm. my weight on it. And mine on goes top. in. Right. Right. So depending on what your issues is, what you emphasize so on. So this right? is a quick note on male and female differences because women do often, ha- men have that issue sometimes, but women very often have that valgus collapse where the knee falls in. Mm. So this is where you can use something like a band right. to, to, to adjust for things like that. What I sometimes do to work on that same thing is rather than using tubing or like the big circle bands I was talking about, using a hip circle band. Oh, They're yeah. about a foot in length. So I don't know. It's like a half a meter, less than half a meter. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't understand your metric system, you guys. Um, <laughs> we use it. About this long. About, about like this. About that wide. Audio podcast. About <laughs> like this, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's just enough to YouTube. get your... <laughs> what? I said get on YouTube, watch us. Oh, okay. Um it's a it's a it's enough space to get both feet into the circle mm-hmm. and then you're able to go through um you can go into stances and different things like that depending on the resistance of the band, depending on exactly how large it is. Mm-hmm. Um I'll use the longer band and double it up and I'll use it for like horse stance related stuff. Mm-hmm. I'll use a smaller actual hip circle band and use that for like stepping in front stance and just practicing the transition point. Mm-hmm. So I don't like wiggle all over myself and so mm-hmm. I get away from that crescent stepping stuff. Sorry for my crescent steppers, but we don't we don't do that here. Is that trying to get away from that? <laughs> Are you embarrassed by me? No. <laughs> I'm just thinking like how dis- divisive you just made our podcast. <laughs> Cuz you know, if you want to know why, send us an email. Now you're provoking a <laughs> What? We can have open conversations. It's fine. As long as you see it our way. Yeah, as long as you... <laughs> anyway, but just working on that hip stability, I actually use different types of bands for that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I, I think people sometimes limit the the function of a tool. Mm-hmm. You no, know I mean? They go, oh, it's just this because that's all they saw. And it's mm-hmm. like you don't ever want to limit the function of a tool. Be creative in your workout. Be able to self-aware enough to know what your weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, created enough to try to fix them. Yeah, test. Test what you've got. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I wouldn't encourage you to go heavy when you do that. Always go light because you'll be surprised how weak some of your muscles really are. If you're really bored, go back through this podcast and to count how many times we said we have said to go light and not heavy. <laughs> yes, go light. Go light. Go light. Um, just to say that, I'll reiterate. Uh, Steve told us last night the most dangerous thing you could do when you're doing any kind of work with bands or weighted wrist, wrist and ankle weights is to go too heavy. Right. Not only does it ruin your technique and your form, mm-hmm. but it puts you in a higher uh, higher risk of injury mm-hmm. that you'll really hurt yourself. And he goes, and that's that's just something you got to learn. Right. So be humble. Yes. Go really, really light. Yeah. For a long time before you increase the weight. Band, resistance, resistance, whatever. That thing. That thing. So, what you working on? Uh, chinte. For show. Chinte still. Um, off. That move after the front kick to the... I can't remember the name of this move, but that it's move the there. double, like, inside the block, down block thing? Yeah, inside block, down block thing. Mm-hmm. That next move where you, you do the big circle with your arm. Mm-hmm. Working on that, working on the timing, the path of it. Um, you know, I've been working on... a. Some Joe Kata too. I, mm-hmm. I'm really starting to enjoy that, mm-hmm. you know, because it is, it's kind of funny. I've been talk, I talk about Chente like, oh God, I'm beating myself over the head with it, right? <laughs> because I know I need to, the, the, the subtleties need to be there. Mm-hmm. Joe Kata, I'm just like so excited to learn something that I don't usually do and that like I'm enjoying it. Like I mm-hmm. love swinging that stick around and yeah, yeah. And, like a lightsaber. Yeah. And <sighs> mentally, mm-hmm. It's a nice break. Yeah, I was going to say, a little release. It's a little release because, you know, you work on this these really minute details in your kata and your movement or, or even your basics, and you get so micro, like, focused on small things yeah. that you, you forget how fun it is to just do the moves, mm-hmm. right? Right. So the Joe Kata for me is, is that right now. I've literally, when I trained, I, first time I trained by myself in 
I'd say months, man. It was mm-hmm. awesome. I finally got to go on the floor and just mm-hmm. do my thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did that joke out at least pff, those 13 steps or so mm-hmm. 30 times. Yeah, the ones that we learned from Rick Hotton? Or- uh, well, so Rick's kata is slightly different than the, the oh, Aikido. Joe 13. Yeah, the Joe 13 is the one that Mick taught us. Okay, yeah. And I just, it was easier to find, like, like corrections in the movements, like move mm. what move goes next. Okay. So... But the, very similar. Yeah. Very, very similar. I think there's just subtle differences, and I think that could be um, who taught the kata. Yeah. You know, who, who's, you know, what lineage you're coming from. So I didn't want to do Rick's thing and then totally mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. And okay. completely mess it up. And then yeah. when we go to go train with him and do it, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow, I've been training the last six months doing this wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> you know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So at least with the, the Joe 13, I could find a YouTube video. And I'm not trying to do the technique exactly like them, but the moves. I want to get the move like sequence correct. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have a strong feeling that I could be able to go back and forth with them because they're very similar. Gotcha. So that's what I've been working on. What you been working on? Um, not saying um. The chinte um, that word. I filmed yesterday was a mess. Mm. So I did not feel good about it at all. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Working still on transitioning from, so the, the, like the second move where you're in horse stance and you got your hands over your head and then you're transitioning into Fudadach, that move is so flipping complicated, that's okay? the third move going into the fourth well, move. Well, that's fine. I don't care what number it is. It's oh. just that one, okay? The one where mm. you transition from the Konkodai type position into the, tati, the first Tatishuto and you're going from horse stance into Fudadach. That is unbelievably complicated trying to not shift my weight back trying to get my feet in the right position get in the footage which is hard enough as it is make sure my head turns at the right time time the transition of my hands put my arms in the right spot by the end not over rotate my hips i feel like i have like 15 flipping things that i'm mm. working on and that's you know it's because i hate myself mm. not really but it is just really um that that move I'm just having a hard time with that one. So mm. after that, I don't think things were much better as far as the rest of that recording went yesterday. But um, that's kind of the main thing that I'm working on. I was in this morning trying to put my feet. I was in the kitchen trying to put my feet in the right spot mm. as I make that turn and you know mm. not look like a white belt doing it. So yeah. <laughs> so that's so, what I'm working on. Yeah. So I'm, I was working on the timing of the punch from Fudodachi to Zenkasaji with the mm-hmm. Um I literally just repped it out, mm-hmm. like, over and over again. Yeah. So, I think that approach is, A, I got to be consistent in my weekend training. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Getting my, my hour and a half, two hours in on Saturday mornings. Yeah. Consistently. I feel like that made a big difference, because last night, my corrections weren't that bad. Mm-hmm. I wasn't, like, horribly failing. Mm-hmm. And they were slightly different. Mm-hmm. I think even the move I worked on the most... I'm going to say it because, you know, I feel pretty confident that it was like, I think he was pleasantly pleased that it was different <laughs> than what it was before. Does that make sense? Like, I'm not going to say he was, he, he was, he wasn't proud. He was like, yeah, you got it. It wasn't that at all. But it was like, oh, just a little bit more down here and a little bit more of this. Yeah. Better than no, you're missing, the, you're missing a whole part of it. Yeah. You know? And that, I thought that was like, I felt like last night's coaching session went better than normal for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and I, I kind of like that because I've been I've been in that horrible like no you're you're no you're missing everything that whole mm-hmm. session that session's like oh god yeah that was me yesterday yeah so, missing everything but <coughs> good times good times and you know it's the small wins that matter that keep you going that's right you know what I'm saying so especially when you feel like you earned them yeah like when you totally you're like yeah I'm better than I was before I could see that. But he sees it too, and it's good, yeah. <laughs> you know. Awesome. Oh my gosh! So I was I mean? gonna make a joke about winning and then having your win taken away because you smoked marijuana, but I <laughs> <clears throat> couldn't really make that loop back to the beginning work very well. So, <laughs> so this is us signing off. Y'all have a great whatever day this is. Sign off. Bye. Oh, bye, bye. <laughs>